Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon and we're sorry we're late, but we're here and we're happy that you have joined us today. We have a very wonderful show in store and and I want to say hello to Emily who is here to join me today and Emily and I go back a long long way and then we have Dr. Temple Grandin on our show so we're really excited to get started and Dr. Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and she's been a pioneer in improving the handling and welfare of farm animals and many of you might remember a documentary about her from a couple of years ago and she's also um, an advocate and outspoken about autism and has so many extraordinary things to say. We're going to just get started. So welcome, Dr. Grandin, to the show. Good to be here. It's really wonderful to see you. And I'm just, I, I want to just turn over the mic to you and just <laughs> tell you to start talking and tell us every, whatever it is that you, I've watched several of your videos and fill us, you know, get us up to date with some of your work with um, animal welfare. And then I want to talk about autism because that's so important. Well, I just got back from Ireland, and I visited two beef packing plants in Ireland, and they were doing a good job. But one of the things I learned is I don't think I'm going to become obsolete in my job because uh, in one of the plants, the cattle didn't want to go up the chute, and all that was wrong was there were some holes in the, in the door, and they could see motion through the holes, and I uh, had them put duct tape over the holes, and then it worked perfectly. Cattle, hmm. cattle it's all about what they see. And how they feel? Well, they're very into what they see. They see little bits of rapid motion. They're just not going to go forward. I've seen a meatpacking plant about shut down by a paper towel hanging out of a dispenser, mm -hmm. just moving a little bit. So since you've started with this, um, how, are, are, we, are, we, are we headed in the right direction with animal the welfare? Is greatly, the industry has greatly improved. I've been in the industry for 40 years. And when I was first started back in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, things were really bad. And uh, I naively thought when I was young that I could fix everything with equipment. What I have found is I can fix half the problems with the equipment. The other half of the problems is the management. And then in 1999, I trained a McDonald's and Wendy's auditors on a really simple scoring system that I developed for the American Meat Institute. And I saw more change happen in that... Uh, year of 1999 when I had the power of McDonald's behind me than I'd seen in my entire career prior to that. And mostly we had to repair stuff. We had to do a lot of stuff with lighting. A lot of non-slip flooring had to be put in. But out of 75 plants, only three had to build something expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lot of little changes and a lot of management that adds up to a really big thing. So I, I've, as I've listened to your um, videos, I've, I've heard you say that people are generalizing too much, and they're well, not, people, go ahead. People generalize too much, both on uh, solving animal behavior problems. They also generalize too much on solving a behavior problem with an autistic kid. Someone will say to me, what do I do about a crazy dog? Well, I don't know, I don't know what the dog did. Or what do you do about autistic kids in the classroom? I don't know, I need to know age. I need to know exactly what the problem is. Right. Autistic kids in a classroom is not enough information, but I get asked those kind of questions all the time. Right. I understand that, I, and I, you've got to be really good at asking questions and finding something that is just the little thing that's not working, the little thing that's out of balance or not there or just needs to be tweaked, and that's the kind of things that we gloss over too much. Well, first of all, let's say with the child, I've got to know the age of the child. Can the child speak? Okay, I need to know that. Then I need to find out, is it a bullying problem? Is he having trouble with math? Does he fidget? I mean, I need to find out what the problem is. But I find the same problem with overgeneralization I, with animals. I can be at a horse behavior conference, and I get the same overgeneralization. What do I do about a crazy horse? Mm -hmm. Well, what did he do? Right. I need to find out exactly when he's acting crazy. And in this particular case, he only acted crazy in a very specific situation where he was cross-tied. An easy suggestion for that. Right. Just use one tie instead of two. So I'm very curious I, um, about your mother, because she was brilliant in how well, mother, she... Go ahead. Mother knew just how much to push me. 
you got to stretch these kids just outside the comfort zone. There's a tendency to do too much for the kids. And uh, mother would always uh, encourage me to do more things. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a little kid, I'd shake hands with people when she had a party, had to learn table manners. Later on, when I was 13, she got me my first job working for a seamstress. She encouraged me to go out to my aunt's ranch. There's a tendency to overprotect. You don't throw these kids in the deep end of the pool, but you've got to stretch and you give them choices. Give them choices of a stressing activity. They can do karate or they can do baseball, but they're not going to stay home in their room all day. Right. And so, and I, and, and I think we, we try too hard to, to, you know, protect them, as you say, and, you know, make sure that they're okay, but we're, we're overdoing that. So well, I'm, I'm yeah. seeing bad things like a fur, fully verbal kid, 13 years old, who's never gone in a store and shopped. And when I suggested to the mom that he do that, she kind of, she got really upset. She says, I can't let go. And there's a point where you've got to start letting go. Don't put them in the deep end of the pool. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I talked to a family where an 18-year-old girl with autism got shoved in a clothing store during Christmas rush for a job. That doesn't work. She should have been put in a clothing store in the, at another time when it's not so busy. Right. And you're, you're a really good listener. I mean, things around, everything around us is giving off information, and you're really able to connect the information that you hear with, and in, with pictures. Well, everything I think about, I have a picture. When I started talking about the 18-year-old, we got shoved into our first job in the store. I'm now seeing her and her mom sitting, and I'm seeing the place where I was at where we were sitting. So do you see, the, you see pictures that are cu current? Or do you see pictures of things that are going to happen, or both? I can see pictures of things from the past. I can start visualizing as I ask more questions. If it's an elementary school classroom, I have a tendency to use my classroom I had as a child, or a classroom that my aunt taught in, or one that I just saw at a school recently. Because mm -hmm. I have to have a, a picture of a, of a mm -hmm. pen as I'm visualizing what's going wrong. Right. You know, you, my, I have a grandson who is, um, he's not autistic, but he's oversensory. And you said something in one of your videos today that I was listening to. You know, he'll go into a Starbucks, and they have the fan um, to dry your hands. And he, yeah. is, it, it may not even be on. And he'll walk in a Starbucks, and he can, he can sense, he can hear that fan even when it's not on. And you made so much sense today for me, even just about my grandson, in just how just being in there can make so much of a difference to his sensory. Well, on the sensory things are very variable. Like if you think you're talking about a hand dryer in the bathroom. Yeah. I would have, I would have hated those things. Now, sometimes uh, kids can be desensitized if they can control the sound. And one of the really bad things about those hand dryers is it's not possible for the kid to control them. No. But let's take something like the vacuum cleaner, where the kid can turn it off, where the kid has absolute control. And uh, now so the computer's got some kind of glitch coming up on the screen, software update, uh, which distracted me. I have problems with um, getting distracted. I'm going to click the software update off. Just, um, just leave, leave it alone and don't pay attention to it. Okay, keep we going. Just keep going. You, we don't All see right. it, so keep going. Yeah, but it's uh, then I get distracted. See, then I get yeah. distracted. I kind of get in another file, and now I'm thinking about computer stuff. <laughs> My uh, life. But I get distracted now. I've forgotten what I've talked. Okay, we were talking about, about the the vacuum, and that you can okay. shut it off. Right. And the um, if the child has control of the stimulus, then it is much better tolerated. I can turn that vacuum off and I can turn it on. But the problem with the hand dryer is it doesn't stop right away. I don't have control of it. So in that situation, the kid needs to just put a headset on when they use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. But the vacuum cleaner, he can turn it on, he can turn it off. And I've heard about kids that were originally terrified of the vacuum cleaner, and then it turned into their favorite thing after they could control the sound of the vacuum cleaner. That may not work with every kid, but I have heard of kids where that has worked. You know, let's say you can't stand a noisy Walmart. Give them some control. We'll go into Walmart. If that's too much Walmart, I'll take you out. Now, the problem is, if they wear a headset all the time, the ear will get more sensitive. It's okay to wear the headset 
they go in that horrible restroom with that really bad um, uh, blower. But then when you come out of the restroom, you need to get that headset off. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and he does, he is one of those children, as you have described, who likes to be, like, likes to be held tight. Yeah, you know, I was one of the pressure seekers. And uh, when I was a little kid, I didn't want to be held. It was like too much stimulation. And that could be desensitized with uh, deep pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what, so your work now, where are you focusing your work? Well, I'm focusing a lot on giving talks to students, uh, encouraging college students, on um, talking to you know, FFA and 4-H groups. I'm still doing my livestock stuff. And I get asked by people in the autism community, why don't you just give up livestock? I think it's important that I have a real job and I have a career that has an identity that's outside of autism. For me, autism is an important part of who I am, but being a college professor and an animal scientist comes first. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing too many kids where they're getting so hung up on their autism, it's just getting to be like all consuming. Right, yeah. I. I like that you said that because that is so true. It becomes so much of an identity. So, and, I, and I'm thinking, based on some of what I've heard you say, that so much of how you have expressed yourself has come from the animals that you've been well, working with. When I first started working with animals, I didn't know that other people were, were not visual thinkers the way I am. I thought everybody thought pictures the same way I think. So it was obvious to me when I started back in the 70s to get down in the chutes and see what cattle were seeing. And they might walk at a vehicle park next to the fence. Well, it's not so obvious to other people that think in a less visual way. But for the first 10 years of my career, I had no idea that really that other people, some people just didn't think in pictures. You know, gradually I learned more and more. I did my book on thinking in pictures in the 90s. That's where I really learned about it. I had some inklings that I was a visual thinker in the 70s, but I had no idea of how extreme my visual thinking was compared to other people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's wonderful that you've been as verbal and out there, I guess, as you have been, so that, so that we, so I, I mean, we, we can understand what, what autism is, what the process is. We, you, you, you're, you've been able to shine such a light and go so deep inside of this to make it so understandable for... Well, what I've tried to do is combine things I've read in the scientific literature along with my own experiences. All throughout my career also in livestock, how do we cross that divide between the practical world and the scientific world? I've always tried to be that, that bridge. And, and you are. And this book that you've... Your recent book, I guess it's your recent book, about the human brain? It's called The Autistic Brain. And in The Autistic Brain, uh, a lot of my brain scans are in there. Found uh, big visual thinking circuits were found. Uh, a Walter Snyder at the University of Pittsburgh did uh, high definition uh, imaging of uh, fiber bundles in my head. Got a very small speak what you uh, see circuit and almost no auditory circuit. Uh, but it confirmed I'm a visual thinker. Now, the other thing we talk about in the autistic brain book is different kinds of minds. I found studies that showed that visual thinking and pattern mathematical thinking are different. And these studies weren't actually done with people with autism. They were done with artists in one group, engineers and architects in another group. That there are big people that are visual thinkers that think in photorealistic pictures, and there's also people that think in patterns. And those are your mathematicians, your programmers, engineers, statisticians, uh, people that uh, think in patterns and numbers. Um, Emily, you, where did you and uh, Dr. Grandin meet? Um, well, I saw a bunch of her like, videos and TED Talks online. It was just after I came out of the hospital and um, I realized that I was diagnosed with autism and everything suddenly made sense to me. My entire life, all these mistakes I've been making, I thought I was the same as everyone else, but, you know, those answers never came to me. But my mom introduced... Um, me to Dr. Grandin just as I came out of the hospital knowing that I was not okay with the news I was given. And um, meeting her in person, that was probably one of the best nights of my life. And one of the things I will greatly remember with that is that 
she took the time to speak with everyone individually and like sincerely we were comparing that to um another signing with um Bill Nye and um we were just talking about how unpleasant that was that he wasn't exactly one to talk to he would just sign the books and like pass them aside send us on our merry way but like compared to that it was one of the greatest experiences I'd ever had and I did indeed look into like fashion design it was something that I had, like set off to the side and when you had recommended it to me again it kind of like it sparks back to me it's like maybe I could really make a future out of this I think you definitely could make a future out of it and the way you need to um, sell yourself is show off your portfolio and show it off in a real professional manner and I suggested you get a hold we have the whole of the fashion design department at, at CSU at my university, Colorado State University, you get that portfolio in the hands of the right people, uh, it, it will sell. You'll, uh, you'll be in. Yeah. Uh, you know, they might not care so much about you're bad at math that, the, that artwork's good enough. What I learned early on in my cattle stuff is to sell my work rather than myself. And I would go in to an interview and I'd just spread the big drawings out because this is all pre- uh, uh, computer era that I started this, spread my big drawings out, show them pictures, show them my brochure, give them some articles I'd done in some cattle magazines, and that portfolio sold the job. What you want is a 30 second wow. Somebody looks at it, wow. Now you're going to have it on an iPad, but it's the same thing, 30 <laughs> second wow. You know, Dr. Grandin, when um, we live here in North Carolina in Raleigh, and I don't re where did you meet Dr. Grandin? What, t what town? Um, NC State U? At, 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 yeah, North Carolina State University. And I met Emily when she was probably like six, maybe. And she, I was doing an event and Emily was there and she had the opportunity to share some things and she was so profound that day. She said some of the, I haven't seen her since and, and until today because you were coming. I invited Emily to come too because I knew she had met you. And she had been so profound and so remarkable that day that I never forgot how incredible she was. So she is an extraordinary young lady, and she's 18. How old are you now? I'm 17 right 17. now. 17. So she's really quite something. Um, and I, so, so Dr. Grandin, so th this, um, this, this whole notion of the people diagnosing autism. I, I know you have a lot to say about that as far as is it, it are we over diagnosing or are we not are, are we just resting too much on the diagnosis? What do you think? Well people get too hung up on the diagnosis. The problem is in 2013 they broadened the spectrum to go all the way from all the uh, guys out in Silicon Valley, Einstein, Mozart, one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum is someone who cannot dress themselves. You know, you used to have the Asperger's, which was socially awkward with no speech delay. Autistic, you had to have the symptoms of autism plus the speech delay. And I think uh, merging that all together has been a big gigantic mistake because an individual like me needs, a, when I was older, needs a very different kind of service than maybe someone who can't uh, speak at age uh, at 10. Uh, it, when I went to school, there were a lot of college students that I know were on the spectrum that were undiagnosed. They were just called geeks and nerds in the 60s. You know, now uh, you're getting everyone that's mildly awkward getting diagnosed. Now, where I see insight is I'll have parents coming to me. They've had their kids diagnosed, and the dad or the mom will say, you know what, I just found out I'm on the spectrum, and that explained why I lost a couple of jobs and why my marriage had problems. An autism diagnosis later in life can provide great insight, especially into personal problems. But on the higher end of the spectrum, on the fully verbal end of the spectrum, on the job front, I'm seeing the diagnosis holding people back, uh, not getting jobs, graduating from college, never had a job, and then do really badly in the workplace. We need to start teaching work skills young, middle school, volunteer jobs, dog walking for the neighbors for a little bit of pay. Maybe I'm volunteering in a nursing home. As soon as they're legal, they need to go into the real economy. They need to learn how to work before they graduate. When I was 13, I had a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. I also went out to my aunt's ranch. And then in college, I did two different internships. 
One is a research lab. Another one is an aid for a child with autism. So by the time I graduated, I had tons of experience doing tasks for people outside the home. This is super important. And when I talk to parents of maybe a 16 year old kid, uh, and they'll say, are you getting a job this summer? And the mom will go, we're thinking about it. I said, we don't want to think about it. Let's get it done. Use your contacts out there in the workplace and get the kid a job and find a boss who's willing to work with them. Short circuit the interview process and find the back doors. Mm -hmm. And this is something I learned from the construction industry. 20 years working on design a job, supervise construction, start up a job, make it work. In construction, you've got to get it done. Right. And you, you need to get the kids done learning how to work. Yeah, you need those specific uh, experiences to be able to draw from and to, to have in your toolbox. Here, here is a question um, on our chat that I would like to ask you, and it's, what do you okay. think of, this is uh, from Chris, what do you think of transcranial magnetic stimulation as an evolving, tr evolving tr treatment um, into the diagnosis of of, of someone being on the autism spectrum? Well, first of all, transcranial is a treatment. It's not a diagnostic method. Okay. I read the John Robinson book, and it, you will not get me anywhere near that thing. I read some of the stuff that John Robinson wrote online uh, about how it really upset his marriage, he almost, he, that he you know, really tipped his life upside down. Uh, it's, uh, uh, that's something I'm going to stay totally away from. Uh, I like the way that I am. <laughs> and I was, it, it really uh, upset John Robinson's life. I saw him recently, and I asked him if he'd ever do it again, and he said no. He's, like, glad that he did it. But then, uh, boy, you read some of the interviews online, they're worse than some of the stuff that he wrote in the book. <laughs> it, it, that book was a real eye-opener of a book. I, you know, it's something that uh, I don't want to change who I am. Now, the effects do wear off. But the thing is, it's sort of like a door being opened, and you're always going to remember the stuff you saw when you opened that door, even though it eventually closes again. Gotcha. So I just want to be respectful of your time, and you said that you... Um... Well, I could stay probably another 15 minutes. Okay, perfect. All right. So we'll, we'll do that so that we uh, keep up with time. So... But what what are um, so specific? You mentioned specific things for for children, for teenagers to do. What other types of treatment support do you? Well, let's just go by ages. Okay. Little, you've got two year olds and three year olds that are not talking. You've got to start early intervention, and there's a lot of different methods out there. But everyone agrees that the child should get 20 hours a week with an effective teacher. What's an effective teacher? more speech, you know, less uh, tantrums and other behavior you don't want. Teach them as words. They've also got to learn turn-taking. Um, I, I, that was taught to me with board games. How do you wait and take a turn? You've got to learn that. Then a little bit older, after I started talking, teaching basic skills. you got to learn all your basic skills, dressing and everything, table manners, uh, saying please and thank you. Um, mother used a method that I like to call teachable moments. If I stuck my finger in the mashed potatoes and then ate it off my finger, mother didn't scream no, she'd, she'd say, use the fork. In other words, when the kid does something that's wrong, instead of screaming no, give them the instruction. Another tip with the young kids is, they're like a slow computer on one bar. You've got to give them time to respond. They're, they have a slower processing speed. You've got to wait for the child to respond. You've got to slow down and speak slowly to the child. You know, then, um, you know, as kids get older, take the thing they're good at, develop it. My art ability showed up in third grade. Build on it. My, I was encouraged to draw lots of different things. If the kid's good at math, then let's expand the math. Don't hold them back. Use a variety of teaching methods. Some kids learn reading with phonics, other kids learn reading uh, with whole word. Uh, use specific examples. I'm a bottom-up thinker. you got to use specific examples to teach concepts. Let's take something simple like the words up and down. Well, use maybe five or six examples of up. The plane flew up in the air. Uh, I stood up. I walked up the stairs. I walked up a hill. Use different specific examples. And then they get in the middle school, want to start um, 
with uh, work skills. Also, I got bullied and teased. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was when I was with a shared interest with peers, like riding horses or electronics. Get kids into things like choir, band, art, robotics, uh, activities they can share with their peers. That's going to help with the bullying. Uh, that was a really important thing for me. But then we need to start learning how to do tasks outside the home, you know, when the kid's in middle school. Uh, and then, of course, the problem is in autism, we've got a big spectrum, and you may have some people on the very severe end of the spectrum where doing jobs outside the home is not going to be an option. But talking about the kids that are, you know, fully verbal and learn to read and write by sixth grade or, you know, even in high school, got to learn how to do tasks outside the home because that prepares them for the workplace. And I had tons of work experience before I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And volunteer work does count. Unpaid internships do count as long as they're on a schedule outside the home. It's important that you walk Mr. Jones's dog, not somebody else's dog. You've got to learn how to do the task on a schedule for people outside the home. So, and here's another question from our chat. Uh, what do you think, let's see, what do you think about formal social skills groups as an intervention versus real life experience and teachable moments? Well, there's some situations where social skills group could be good. It all depends upon who is running that group. That gets back to management. But you also need to get out and do things out in the real world. Teaching shopping in a fake store, I do not approve of that. You need to go out to a real store. You mm -hmm. might say, when going to McDonald's, you can buy one item on the dollar menu. And then you go another place, you go somewhere else. But you do have to learn things out in the real world. Uh, now, a social group in certain situations can be good, so I'm not going to be too rigid about this. Uh, the thing I always ask parents when they ask about programs is, is the kid improving? Like, if it's a little kid, are you getting more speech, better turn-taking, less tantrums, you know, you know, just obvious improvements. So sometimes you just have to try something. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you do. And uh, But I'm seeing too many kids get overprotected where they're not learning something as basic as, as um, going into a store and buying something when they're 13 years old and fully verbal. Right. The moms tend to overprotect on things that basic. And that my mom, oh, she had me shopping by the time I was seven. So how did your that. how did your mother know so much back then? She, there wasn't I mean there wasn't that much for her to go by. How did she uh, how did she some know? Of this is old fashioned fifties parenting. Because uh -huh. when I went over to the Woods house, uh, Mrs. Wood corrected my behavior. When I went to the Culver's house, Mrs. Culver was really strict on correcting me that I shouldn't have cut all my meat up at the same time. Uh, everywhere you went, grown ups corrected kids. You go in a store and if I ran behind the counter the Grown-ups would say only the clerks are allowed behind the counter. Grown-ups corrected little kids in the 50s. That's not being done today. That was done with all children. Yeah, that's very, very true. We live in a very different world. And, you know, back then, I remember when we lived in an apartment building in New York. And, you, you know, people knew who you were. And, you know, it was more of a community in some regard. Well, so. we're going to have to control the screen use. When I was a little kid, TV was uh, controlled to an hour a day. Uh, you just can't let a kid zone out on screens for six hours a day. I'm not suggesting banning video games, but we've got to strictly limit it because I'm seeing really bad uh, outcomes with recluses in the room that uh, just playing video games all day and they're not doing anything else. Right. And if you've got one of those recluses, you need to wean them off really slowly and replace it with something else. And let's talk about where the good jobs are. I've been doing some talks recently about artificial intelligence and what's in the computer. And uh, uh, skilled trades are not going to go away. Uh, uh, nobody's uh, uh, computer's not going to fix your toilet. Uh, <laughs> not going to fix your car. Uh, not going to wire your house. That's going to need skilled trades. Those jobs are not going to go away. The kinds of jobs we need to be worried about is something like the doctor or the radiologist. The doctor that does a specialty, the radiologist job, that's going to disappear. Computers are going to do highly specialized knowledge jobs, but they're not going to do frontline jobs like a pediatrician or a general practice doctor. Um, I, so that's one of the reasons why I'm pushing skilled trades so much, because these jobs will not get replaced by computers. And all I know is that the computers are always watching because I, um, 
talk, been talking about Watson and artificial intelligence. And then I get beef plant video tour in one of my videos up online. And guess what? Watson advertisement on it for a program that can help diagnose mechanical problems on aircraft. And I've talked a lot about aviation as examples because I kind of like aviation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very interesting that you would uh, bring that up, too, because, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, many times, and, and we know that so, you know, a lot of people in Silicon Valley ha are on the spectrum. And if these technology and jobs go away, what are they going to do? Well, they'll probably find things to do because it's always going to be straightening out the mess. So they'll, uh, help, yeah. I. Uh, I'm concerned on a lot of things, on cutting back too many jobs for people right away, and I think there could be some real messes coming in uh, banking, and uh, uh, right now just self-submitting scientific papers is turning into a mess because publishers have outsourced so much of the work, and they're trying to automate more of the stuff, and recently I got a completely corrupted, jumbled journal article proof that was completely messed up and all, and all these robo-letters. They're trying to automate too much too fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 yeah, too much too fast, absolutely. And they don't have it's the... Too much, it, they're doing it too fast and uh, taking you know, too many people out. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd recommend, uh, you know, if you bank online, you better print out your statements. <laughs> exactly. So they don't have the infrastructure to handle the too fast. They're going well, too the fast. Well, the mistake that gets made, my brother just retired from a bank uh, and his job was when this bank bought other banks, they'd uh, merge the computer systems together. And the thing that always happened is the big bosses that are totally far away from the field would always underestimate the amount of time it would take to merge the systems. I found the same problem with construction problems, with construction projects, that people that tended to be highly verbal always underestimate the amount of time it would take to do steel and concrete work. And so you try to do this stuff too fast. And that's where you get into a complete mess. Well, there's even I've seen jobs where they tried to build them too fast. Total mess when you get the bosses too far removed from the field. And I'm a big proponent of getting the suits out of the office and having them see what's actually happening out there in the field when they cut back on too much staff too quickly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's very important to, to be able to see, just like you see pictures I see pictures, I see words, I see... I don't see words. I can I, see words. No, I don't see words. I see the picture that the word stands for. And if it's a word that doesn't have any meaning, like the, I see a flashcard from elementary school. Uh -huh. Because that word doesn't have any meaning. Right. But for people like it's you're it. talking about who are, let's say, the suits in the offices, if they need to see the things going on because that's their picture. But the problem is, is that oftentimes it's just a spreadsheet. I remember one time um, uh, reading a business magazine and it had this big picture taken from a helicopter of a gigantic, huge power plant. And this executive was flying over it, and everything in the past to him had just been spreadsheets, abstract numbers. And he flies over the power plant and looks down and goes, I'm in charge of that? <laughs> <laughs> You see, everything was an abstraction before. That's the problem. And now it was no longer abstract when he flew over it. Mm. You see, you just stay in the office and you're a word person, it all becomes numbers and spreadsheets. Right. But the real, actual processes of doing things uh, take time. I saw undercover boss moments when I brought McDonald's executives <laughs> on their first trips out to slaughter plants. And, and this was 20 years ago now, so I can talk about it. But I remember the day one of the vice presidents saw a half-dead dairy cow go into their product, and he was just horrified. True, undercover boss moment, just like that show. Mm -hmm. That's why I really like that show, because I'm seeing what the frontline workers really are doing. And yes. when you do things too abstractly, you tend to underestimate the amount of time it takes to do tasks. Right. Whether it's building a meat plant or merging computers at a bank. So things are being left out when you see them too abstractly. Well, that's why, okay, obviously this manager can't go to every field person on the front lines. What they need to do is do it in, you know, like what, do what's called a grab sample, grab sampling. 
you just kind of go out and visit the front lines in a few different areas. So you get some kind of random sampling of what's going on in the front lines, because they can't go to every branch of a bank. They can't uh, uh, go to every construction project they might be, uh, the, that a big company might be in charge of, especially if it's a whole lot of little ones. But you have to at least be getting out there and sampling things. What's going on in the front line? Yeah, and you, you can't gotta, rely on other people not to... Not be abstract is what you got to do. Right, and you can't rely on other people to tell you what they see. You've got to be able to see it, too. You can't rely on what you other people's to, impressions. You need to see just enough right. so that you don't forget what's going on on the front line of whatever business that you're in. Now, you see, for me, I don't forget. I don't forget. <laughs> see, the visual thinker, I can bring it up. I can remember how hot and sweaty I was when I was 110 degrees in Arizona and we were vaccinating over 1,000 paddles in one day. How hot and tired I was. I will never, ever forget that. So one thing I talk about all the time, stockmanship and livestock stuff, is you cannot understaff and overwork. You work someone a 10-hour shift when it's that hot, they're going to do sloppy work. I've been there. And I don't forget it. See, I think in pictures, so I don't forget it. I can start feeling how hot it's. I remember the feed yard. I can now, my hand is so tired, squeezing. It was an old Franklin pistol grip syringe. Squeezing this thing, and it was just so horrible. My hand was so tired. I, I, I don't forget it. Maybe that's an advantage of being a visual thinker. I don't forget it. Uh, so do you, do you, so you associate, a, uh, do, you, do you associate um, a feeling and experience with the pictures? I'm now feeling hot. My hand is starting to bother me because it's a thing was quite hard to squeeze the handles on for the, give the cattle the injection. Um, I can, I see it first mm -hmm. and then I start to get some of the other senses. I'm hearing the sound of the squeeze shoe kind of clattering and, and the cattle uh, bumping against a steel facility. But I get the Picture comes up first. It comes up as a still. And then I can make little videos with it. Um, I don't remember everything I go to. I don't remember every hotel room. I don't care about hotel rooms. I only remember them if they're either really awful or really <laughs> weird. That I can get remembered. Uh-huh. Wow. This kind of thing happens um, with me in like terms of audio. Like, I listen to music so much, I usually have my earbuds in all the time, but... Like, when I listen to music and it's a certain place, like I'm on a class trip or something, like, the type of music I'm listening to at that point will give me, like, a vibe. I feel this sort of sensation that I did when I was in that particular area. And, like, it's all, it's just a combination of songs. Whenever I listen to, like, a certain piece of music that pops up in my head, sometimes I will, because I don't have the time to edit any movies, um, some of the songs I listen to, I completely map out, like, music videos or like some sort of visual presentation of like what they what they like what they represent in my mind something i wish i could you know make into an actual video someday but i have not the time well sometimes i get musical associations okay one time i remember we were out driving and i went by this old the dilapidated garage and now i hear the song Inside a rickety old garage is a brand new super stock Dodge. <laughs> go, granny, go, granny, go, granny, go. I will sometimes get those kind of uh, uh, musical associations. I see a racetrack and I go, Camp Town Racehouse, do da, do da. Uh, I'll get a musical association. Mm -hmm. And, like, again, with um, sometimes people will say, like, certain words, and I'll remember, like, if I'm watching, like, a gamer's video or whatnot that expression will pop up in my head, like, if someone says, like, expounded upon. I, I talk, like, my, I talk like my favorite YouTube idol all the time at this point, and, um, he says a lot of really complicated things, but when someone, like, someone taps into that sort of language, it's like, this quote comes up in my head, or, like, a multitude of quotes about, like, something that he might have just said, and I don't really know how to explain it, but, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you see, they, they, if you look at the, um, some of the brain research, there may be more brain circuits in the back of the head where you have some of these sensory things. Um, 
extra, you know, the math addition, maybe extra circuits for doing the mathematical. I think a brain can be more social emotional or a brain can be more thinking. Now within a certain range, it's just normal variation. One does a very mild autistic trait become geeks and nerds and just variation. You see, it's a continuous trait. And uh, there's some interesting research that shows that in, in animals, for example, that dogs are much more social and we've bred them to be that way than the wolf is. But the wolf is sometimes better at some cognitive tasks. Uh, it's, it, 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 in its mild forms, it's just normal variation. But then you get into the more severe forms, uh, like maybe a child that remains nonverbal and can't do basic skills. That's on the way far other end of the spectrum. That I was actually thinking of on the way over. I remember the study that I had watched, um, I believe it was with my little sister, but like comparing wolves to dogs, like a dog will like look for help if it doesn't know That's how right. to like That's right. solve a the situation wolf. where the, as the wolf will like try a little harder. It was like all these terms of evolution where things start to get, things start to get different and like the body kind of, it kind of like becomes more vulnerable as it adapts to these changes. Well, they, there is studies done on the wolf and the dog, and what was done in the study was uh, they had a wolf watch another wolf open up a box, kind of a puzzle box thing that had treats in it, and, they, and the wolf will just patiently watch the other animal and go do it. But the domestic dog's so busy asking us for help, that he doesn't pay enough attention to how another dog opens a box to go do it. Exactly. We've bred them to be hypersocial, and there's been a number of very, very interesting papers on this. So it's, it's like we're, um, what we're doing with children in some regard, we're doing with our, with our dogs. We're overprotecting them. Well, I've seen a lot of dogs don't have a chance to do any doggy social life. I'm, I'm, they're out being walked and they don't let them sniff things. I'm, I'm, when I was a child, all the dogs ran loose and the downside of that was dogs getting hit by cars. But the upside of it is they had very few behavior problems compared to the problems, behavior problems dogs have now in some of it is they're just not getting socialized enough because in Fort Collins we have draconian leash laws and it's a lot of work to take your dog out someplace where he can get socialized. It's, 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 it's just, this has been so, such a revelation listening to us compare animals and people in the regard, in the way we are. Well, it's, there's actually a paper where a bunch of, a big review of literature was done on animals that are more social versus animals that are are uh, less social and some of the genetics has crossovers like for example lions are more social than panthers now that doesn't mean that panthers are defective they're just they're just different um, gorillas are uh, chimpanzees for example are more social than the orangutan the orangutan is spend more time solitary than the gorilla and there's a big interesting review article on, uh, on social and less social animals and relating it to some autism uh, traits. Uh, a fascinating paper. You see within the, in the uh, milder forms, it's just normal variation. A panther's just a normal cat variation from a lion. Or the orang is a normal variation from a, from a chimp. In terms of how social they are. Now that those animals that are more solitary are not completely non-social, but they're less social than animals that live in groups. So, Dr. Grandin, is it is it? I, I and I don't want to use the word wrong, but I don't know what other word to to use. But sometimes when I meet someone who I know is somewhere on the autism spectrum, I somehow I sort of make an assumption that they have. That there's some gift, some 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 strong gift that they have. Not that we that we all don't have a gift, but they have some strong focus of something that is really like interesting, extraordinary, intense. Is that true? That well, they usually have uneven academic skills. That's real common. More uneven skills, and uh, yeah, usually they often have a, something they're really interested in. Now, I want to make it very clear about the different kinds of thinking in autism. It's when I was younger, I made the mistake of saying that everybody on the spectrum was a visual thinker. That's not true. You know, what I have learned now, and I talk about this in the autistic brain book, is there are photorealistic visual thinkers like me. Then there are the pattern thinkers. These are gonna be a Silicon Valley guys. 
that are were good with mathematics and programming. And then you got the guy that often loves history, who's a word thinker. They don't have pictures in their head. Well, what tends to happen in autism is getting more specialized kinds of thinking. And I made the mistake when I was younger to think that everybody on the spectrum thought the way I did. But there is a tendency to get interested in certain things to get interested in and for the skills to be good at one thing and bad at something else. That's also kind of a general uh, thing. Gotcha. Well, you, you know, I just want to say again, I uh, just want to make you aware that I think we've been at the, uh, and you can stay on because we have another eight minutes to the end of the show, but I want to let you know that if you are, if you need to go, you certainly Well, this interview has been so good that I think I'll stay on for the other Oh, <laughs> yay! I'm going to grab takeout yay! for one. Yay! Oh, my God. My uh, I don't get to the airport on time. Okay, well, we'll make sure we end exactly on time. But, oh, thank you so much. This has been such a, a pleasure. So tell us what we should talk about next. Tell us what, 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 what do you think we should know in the last couple of minutes that we have? Well, why don't you just ask me something? Well, so what do you do in, so what do you do in your f free time? It's, I mean, what's your life like up there, and what do you do in your free time? Well, I like to read. I subscribe to tons of science uh, magazines. I get science and nature. That's just my, pl my pleasure lunch reading. <laughs> I forgot to take my new nature with me. Go to lunch, but I'm not going to have time to read it anyway at lunch. i got to just gobble it down. Um, I like, you know, science fiction. also like a lot, you know, serious books, too. Go to a movie. Avatar was one of my favorite movies. Had to see that in the theater. I saw Avatar <laughs> on the screen in the plane. I was terrible on a plane. That movie had to be seen on the screen. I went to a theater to see that. Mm. Other movies are fine on a plane. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Emily, what do, what do you want to know? I honestly have no idea. I've learned so much, and... Ma. <laughs> <laughs> She's very, I would wish, I wish it, we, you were able to see her. Um, and, and me, of course. <laughs> but certainly Emily. Well, technical problems. Yeah. I, it's like every time they keep changing something, and just as you get something technical to work, then they change it. And then it's like, you know, one of the reasons why the iPhone was successful was because the interface was simple. Steve <laughs> Jobs was an artist. Yeah. He wasn't a program. An artist designed the interface and... The programmers had to make the inside of the phone work. That's why you need the different kinds of minds. Exactly. Now, that was I'm like seeing you now. That was something you had established. You I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That was something you had established. Like, Jobs may not have had like the technical capabilities that other people did. He designed the software. Other people made it happen. Like okay. that sort of thing. Steve Jobs did not design the, the, the computer stuff. Steve Jobs was an artist. He was an industrial designer. In fact, all the work that I've done in the cattle industry, it like in comes terms of the software. umbrella of industrial design. And, and uh, Steve Jobs designed a simple to use interface. The engineers that get the phone so complicated, you're not going to be able to use it. Uh, the engineers and the programmers had to make the inside of the phone work. So when you swipe it, it will swipe. Boy, now the pictures come on. I wish the picture had been on sooner. <laughs> All I saw was this horrid symbol in the middle of the screen going yeah. like this as I talked. Very distracting. Oof. And then Microsoft wanted to do an update in the middle of it. But now I can see you. I wish I could have seen yes. you earlier. Sorry <laughs> about that. But uh, you, you, you have alluded in your video that, and it's so true, that you and Steve Jobs were so similar. That he, in his area, he did his thing. In your area, you did yours. But That's right. in some similar way, you And he was bullied in school. He uh, was a, he was a, that book about him, he was a weird loner. It brought snakes to school. He was bullied in school. Um, when I do my, uh, my TED type of talks now, I talk about students that had an unconventional career path. Uh, Jane Goodall did her famous work on a two-year secretarial degree. Thomas Edison was a hyperactive high school dropout that almost surely would be diagnosed with autism. What would happen to Thomas Edison today? You know, I, I don't know. And there's a lot of, you know, kids that are grown up to be really big in business. They were bullied in school. They had some kind of special ed problem. And I'm worried today that these kids aren't going to be, you know, fulfilling their potential. And so when I do my talks today to the general public, I talk about what would happen to Thomas Edison today, for example. So, so if a child, a teenager wants to drop out of school, what do you think? 
Well, it's, I've got to depend upon the situation here. Right. Uh, Too general. Fully verbal, verbal, fully verbal teenager. I want to get him working. I want to figure out what career he could go into. He can finish up high school online as far as I'm concerned. But the one thing he's not going to do is become a recluse in this room. Because the recluses in the room are having awful outcomes. I don't want to go into all the awful outcomes. But they have been awful. And, and you want to drop out of school, finish up online, let's start working. And there's all kinds of um, tools available for self-publishing, uh, free stuff online. Get a LinkedIn account. You need to do that with your fashion. Put it up on a LinkedIn account. I went, just went to a seminar on LinkedIn, and they've got publishing tools I didn't even know about. Um, I want that boy to have a good outcome. In construction, it's all about outcomes. Who builds things and make it work? It's about outcomes. Now, if that boy gets a good job in skilled trade and likes it, or some other job at Silicon Valley and he likes it, keeps it, that's just great. I was one of the students where a normal high school did not work. My parents spent a lot of money to send me to a very expensive school of horse barn management. And for the first three years, about all I did was clean horse stalls. But they made me be on time. I had to attend <laughs> classes, I had to attend meals. And then Mr. Carlock, my fabulous science teacher, he came on, he came in in the last year and a half to get me turned around and get me interested in studying to become a scientist. But for three years, my mother and father paid a lot of money to send me to the School of Horse Barn Management. Mother was not too thrilled about that. But the headmaster said, let her get through her adolescence. But looking back on it, I learned one of the most important things in the School of Horse Farm Management, very expensive School of Horse Farm Management. I learned how to work. And there's a lot of different ways we can do this same thing without spending a lot of money. You right. just got to look for what's available in the neighborhood. I have found today in this electronic age that a lot of people just aren't resourceful. They don't even think to look it up online. Right. right. They make things too easy and they make too many assumptions. Well, there's too much. The school can't do everything. Mm -hmm. I want to see kids be everything that they can be. Okay, let's say it's somebody on the, on the more severe end of the spectrum. Well, I want to make sure if he's capable of dressing himself, that he learns how to do it. And one of the things that's going to have to be done is you've got to wait for him to respond. You may have to put that T-shirt over his head super slow, otherwise he can't process it. And there are some people on the spectrum that are nonverbal that have got a normal brain inside, like Tico, Tito or Makapatahe. How can I talk if my lips don't move? Um, and he described a jumbled century world. He also said that before he had typing, it was, it was loneliness. It was emptiness. It was very, uh, felt empty. There's some nonverbal people that can learn to type. I want to help people do everything that they can reasonably do. Because as I go back and forth between the autism world, the cattle world, and even the tech world, I'm seeing that the Silicon Valley guy. Oh, NASA is lots of fun. Oh, spot they asked me there. Find the messy offices. One way to find them. Uh, it's uh, and I've had granddads who work for NASA that have an autistic son tell me that. Oh, look at those old mission control videos. <laughs> the old ones, the real old ones. You look at them. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> you look at them. Uh. Look them up online. <laughs> and, and you see a little bit of autism that got us to the moon, that gave us computers, that gave us great art. Then you get too much of it, and you get some very, very severe handicaps, because this is the problem. We've got a spectrum that's so big, and the different parts of the spectrum have very, very different needs. Well, you, you, well, you have offered up and given us so much information and wonderful, wonderful ways of thinking today, and... I mean, and I just, great, right? Mm -hmm. And we're. Well, I really enjoyed this interview. That's why I didn't stop. So I'm going to have to just go to, you know, some little fast, super fast place to eat lunch. Probably the convenience store. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you being here so, so much. And I know we waited a long time to try to get the right date. And so thank you. And thanks, Cheryl. Well, now, did, did my picture come through okay? Yes, you look great. <laughs> and thanks, well, I Cheryl. Wish I could have seen you, Emily. I, I, it's so nice seeing the picture now. I've <laughs> had a horrid thing in the middle of the screen that was going like that every time I talked. Yay, you got the letter. Well, and will yeah. you thank Cheryl for us too? Because she's been instrumental in helping us create today. Okay, well, good to talk to you. I guess Likewise. now it's time to go because I am going to have to get to the airport. Okay, thank well, you, thank Dr. you so much. Uh,
Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 And thank everybody out there so much for being with us today, okay. and Chris and everyone. Thank you. Okay, this was bye. a special day. Emily. Yay! Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, Emily. Right? Yeah. Yes, Emily uh, waited a long time. We've been trying to get Emily here. Dr. Grandin, enjoy your lunch. Okay. Um, Emily and I go back a long way, and she was instrumental in things that I experienced in, uh, in where I am today. I want to thank Emily because years ago we did an event, and Emily was there as a child. How old were you? She doesn't remember me. I was, it was like, what, maybe seven years ago yeah. something and she um she she was so profound that day it was remarkable so i want to thank emily thank you and she was great so anyway everyone any final words uh i don't know everything's already been established what did you think of today that's it that she says a mouthful right there right that's that's all i gotta say did, did about you, that okay I kind of wish I could have said more, though. I was scared. Well, what, say it now. You have great things to say, Emily. You were scared or you are scared? I still am. Oh. What would you, look at, would you, hmm? what would you say to me? I mean, I'm really surprised that I had made like such a big impact in like your experiences and I'm honored to have like inspired you I in a sense and like <clears throat> thinking that I could actually be like some sort of brilliant is awesome to me kind of like thinking of these things even at the last minute it's like such a feeling of adrenaline and like euphoria and whatnot. It's this amazing feeling like you're being lifted up. But yes, thank you for giving me that. You're welcome. And now, you know, like what Dr. Grandin was saying, how you want to see everybody, I mean, just live their fullest. And so that's what I want to see from you. You gave me so much when you were five years old. <laughs> I mean, we're talking, how old are you now? 17. 17. So we're talking 12 years ago. She gave me so much in that, in that moment. She made me realize that some of what I was doing was right. And so I want you to go take this and promise me that you're going to do what you have to do. I will, definitely. You promise? Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an mp3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.